be very timely and punctual. So, handing over to Ajahn Bhamali for the afternoon. Okay, great, thank you. So, uh, welcome back again. And uh, uh, let us continue where we left off. And just to remind you very briefly, we are uh, looking at some verses that are um, talking about the Noble Eightfold Path in a more kind of non-literal way with the metaphors and similes and these kind of things, a, a bit more poetic uh, license on uh, how we talking about the Noble Eightfold Path. And um, so we're going to carry on with these verses. Um, and the third verse here is uh, where it says uh, in this particular translation, it has that the sense of shame is the safety rail there. And the sense of change and safety, we're talking about a chariot, and the idea is not to fall off the noble eightfold path. If you fall out of the chariot, then you're no longer on the noble eightfold path. So the safety rail that kind of holds you on, keeps you on board the noble eightfold path is a sense of shame, it has here. Um, and so Dr. translates this as conscience instead. So uh, uh, which one is right? And um, I think they both are useful and suitable translations. Conscience is a bit more of a positive word, and shame often has a kind of negative feeling to it. But uh, I think the Pali word, which is hearing here, actually is quite close to the English idea of shame. And I think the word shame, sometimes it is uh, appropriate to use. There are times when shame is really bad. Uh, and we use you know, people get shamed for things that they should never really be shamed for, I don't know, for having a disability or being overweight or for whatever. Of course, that is terrible. That is not what, what is meant by shame in this particular case. So, but sometimes shame has the quality of feeling bad about simply doing something bad. Yeah, you feel bad about yourself because you did something bad. And that kind of shame, I think, has, has a very powerful and important place on the Buddhist path. In fact, as it says here, it is precisely the thing that, or one of the things that stops you from falling off the path, because that degree of purity that we need to have on the path, the uh, you know purifying the virtue, etc., is so fundamental for the whole practice. So, unless we have those qualities that keep us on the straight and narrow, stopping us from falling out of the chariot. It's not going to work out. So I think shame in certain uh, contexts is actually a, a useful thing. But, you know, when you have done something, you don't really want others to know what you have done. Uh, yeah, that's kind of shame. Yeah, you are ashamed of yourself because you did something which is not quite right. Uh, and I think that is probably a positive thing yeah, because it helps us uh, leaning in the right direction on this path. Uh, so uh, I think. Um, yeah, so, so just to kind of rescue the word shame a little bit from the bad, all the bad connotations that it often has. Uh, and then you have uh, moving towards the kind of higher as aspects of the noble eightfold path. Uh, mindfulness is its upholstery. Uh, mindfulness is the upholstery of the chariot. Uh, and it's like an interesting idea that mindfulness is the upholstery. Why might that be the case? And uh, uh, to get a feeling for this, there is another sutta which is found in the Magga Sangyutta, the connected discourses on the path, the fourth sutta there, which also has all these verses on the Noble Eightfold Path. And there it says that non desire is the upholstery of the chariot. Yeah? And uh, that's also a very interesting point because very often we think of desire as the thing the uh, driving force in our life, which is going to get us those things that, is going, that are going to make us comfortable. Desire is like a movement towards comfort. Uh, but actually, from the Buddha's point of view, that is not how you get comfortable. Uh, and simply because the desire itself is an uncomfortable state, as we have just discussed at length before. Uh, so comfort, uh, if you want to be at ease, uh, if you don't want to be restless and agitated, and you want to have that stillness of the mind, that, that it comes from non-desire, lack of desire, which is fascinating. That is the upholstery of the chariot of the Noble Eightfold Path. 
And mindfulness is very closely related to the idea of non-desire. Yeah, to be able to be properly mindful, that you cannot have too much restlessness in the mind, you cannot have a desire which always takes you to the future. Desire by its very definition is the future, is about where you want to be, where you want to go. And you cannot have the anger, which is very often about the past. So mindfulness requires that we abandon both ill will and desire to a very high degree. So, of course, when these things die down, the mind becomes clear, you are fairly present with what is going on in the here and now, then you will also feel a sense of comfort as a consequence. You won't be buffeted by all these desires, which kind of pull the mind in this direction and that direction, but instead you will kind of have a sense of presence. So, there's something very powerful about that, uh, something very beautiful about mindfulness. When it becomes really established, uh, it feels as if you have a control in your life. You feel like you are in charge of yourself. So, yeah, it's like, uh, uh, you know, very often in life, if you have no mindfulness and you run around, uh, and you see things that you find delightful and beautiful. Uh, uh, and straight away, the mind gives rise to desire because of that. It's as if things are out of control, in a way. Uh, when you meet somebody who you may have a problem with, yeah, and straight away, a sense of aversion or ill will arises towards that person. Again, as if you have no control. Uh, but mindfulness has that ability of you standing back, uh, you're observing it, and you can actually see that you know ill will or desire is about to arise. And then using your wisdom, you can change the trajectory of your mind. You can think about things in a new way. You can establish an alternative perception in your mind. Yeah, a perception of, of a, not desire in regard to the world because you know it is pointless anyway, that, that desire. Most likely it is pointless. Or an alternative perception of the person that you're looking at, more compassion, more understanding, or whatever. And then so mindfulness allows you to have that even mind. It's a power in your life. You feel it instead of the defilements being in charge, instead of craving being the eternal slave driver, you're like a free slave. You're no longer a slave at all, in fact. You are a free person because of that. And this is why. Mindfulness, the, uh, it is said to be uh, an adipateya. Adipateya means like a, a lordship. Yeah? It lords over other phenomena and you become in charge of it. So the two things that are kind of qualified as adipateya in uh, some of the suttas in the numerical discourse, they said the first one is uh, mindfulness and the second one is samadhi. Uh, you start to get control over your life when you have mindfulness mindfulness because you are able to regulate your mind, regulate your emotions, uh, regulate your perceptions, etc. And that becomes even more powerful when you have samadhi, when the mind becomes extraordinarily, has an extraordinary ability to be present uh, and to know how to direct your attention in a positive way. Yeah, like the Yoniso Manasikara, the wise attention that we were talking about before. Uh, these are the powers of the mind that empower the mind make you feel like you are free yeah in a certain way it doesn't mean that you have a sense of self it doesn't mean that you are you know that, that i can do what i i want as if there is some real i in there it means that you're free of a certain oppression because then you start to understand how oppressive these defilements of the mind actually are so mindfulness is upholstery yeah mindfulness makes the world more soft more gentle, there's this bumps in the road when you have mindfulness. Uh, yeah, the mind does not kind of jump up and down so much anymore. Uh, your, your travel in samsara is smooth. Uh, and as you are traveling in a smooth way in samsara, you're also reducing the defilements at the same way. Uh, yeah, the Buddhist path is comfortable and moving towards a very worthwhile goal at the same time. That's isn't that kind of really attractive? Yeah, it's a nice path if you get it right. It feels good. Yeah, and at the same time, you're moving towards a goal that is supremely worthwhile. Two uh, amazing things coming together in this way. So mindfulness is the upholstery. Yeah? And then the Dhamma here is the charioteer that drives the chariot. Yeah, so you get the teachings of the Buddha. Uh, you have faith in those teachings, and then those teachings become the uh, become what guides you in your life. Yeah, they become like the charioteer taking over the driver's seat. 
it's like the Buddha has invaded your mind. They're taking over the driving inside of you. And of course, that is a positive thing if the Buddha, you know, would know you, because the Buddha knows where happiness is to be found. So he will drive you in the right direction. The charioteer inside, the map, the map is within you. And then you just have to follow that map to traverse the ter territory in a, in a way which leads in the right direction. And then with right view running out in front, yeah, right view being the thing which guides this whole path. And uh, the Dhamma is a charioteer, and the Dhamma then informs the right view at the beginning, which is like the a horse like, uh, pulling the chariot. And it, but, uh, the Dhamma, then, the right view, in the other sutta, it is called wisdom and faith. Yeah, so wisdom and faith and right view, all of these things are basically the same thing. The different angles on the same problem, different angles on the same thing. Yeah, wisdom, faith, and right view. And so these are the things that pull the chariot because they understand the direction that we're supposed to go in. So that is right view. So that is the uh, the noble eightfold path for you in uh, in brevity. Yeah. So. Um, all the factors are sort of there. The one factor that might be missing a little bit is uh, perhaps uh, samadhi is not really mentioned in this particular one, but it might be implied perhaps. I'm not sure. It could perhaps be implied under mindfulness. I'm not sure, entirely sure. But the basic idea here is that right view runs out in front. Yeah, the right view is what kind of knows the direction, knows where we're going, understands what the reality of the world. And then, as I said before, from that understanding of reality, having clarity about the world, yeah, seeing things as they actually are, we get our values right. We start to value those things really worthy of value. There's so many things in the world that we're wasting our time on that are not really worthy of our attention or anything like that. And so often we value the wrong things. But with the right view, our values fall into place. When the values fall into place, then again, we, uh, we um, get our priorities right. We get our priorities right. We intend, we seek the goals, the purposes that are worthwhile. Samasankapa or the path starts to arise then. And then the rest of the path after Samman Sankapa is really a path of purification. Yeah, you, we have the very famous uh, meditation work, commentary work called the Visuddhimagga, such an important part of the Theravada Buddhism, yeah, the Visuddhimagga. But uh, really, it is the Noble Eightfold Path, which is the Visuddhimagga. If you look at what it is about, it is really about purifying ourselves, purifying ourselves of these defilements that lead to so much suffering and destroy our clarity and destroy our ability to see things in the right way. So the whole path then, yeah, right, uh, right speech, right action, right livelihood, they obviously are about purity, and, yeah, getting rid of the, all this negative content in the mind. And right effort is also really about purity, about overcoming the mental defilements, uh, yeah, on top of all the defilements of body and speech. Uh, then we come to Satipatthana, which is really mindfulness here, yeah, the seventh factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, and Satipatthana really also is about purity, it's about um, getting rid of the last defilements of the mind. And that's why Satipatthana is just before Samadhi, sama, Samadhi, yeah, because it is that what helps us to overcome the last obstacles so that then uh, enable us to achieve Sama Samadhi as a consequence. And then that Sama Samadhi is what uh, gives a rise to even more right view. Yeah, this, is, this is when you get the real right view. So it loops back to the beginning again. You get the right view. Of course, then the path is in full, it gets much more powerful because now your right view is informed by a very powerful mind in Samadhi. And the whole path becomes really, really powerful. This is why, when you, especially when you become a street mentor. So that is the basic sequence of this path. The right view is at the beginning. Yeah? But there's also like a feedback mechanism. Yeah? Every factor, later factor on the path, feedbacks to the beginning. Yeah? And they all kind of work together in this way. Yeah? And uh, so it's a, it's a complex path. But the main kind of uh, mechanism here, is starting with right view and then going up to Sama Samadhi. And from that, having the kind of uh, awakening experience. So.
So th this is how the normal eightfold path works. And uh, but uh, the way that the Buddha teaches this in the suttas, he teaches this uh, uh, in many from many different angles. Uh, and so we're going to look at this noble eightfold path uh, from not from so much a descriptive point of view, where we describe what we are supposed to do. Yes, speak like this, act like this. Uh, but one of the most interesting ways of thinking about the noble path is from a psychological point of view. Uh, how does it? What does it feel like? Uh, because ultimately, the noble eightfold path is a psychological state. Yeah, it is a, what is happening inside of you. Where is your mind at? Do you have the noble eightfold path in your mind right now? Are the factors present? And the more of these factors are right there in your mind, yeah, the feeling of speaking rightly or thinking rightly or mindfulness and all of these things, you have starting to internalize that path. So the path is actually really a psychological thing. Yeah? And especially in meditation practice, uh, you can see all of these factors start to arise inside of you, one after the other. It's like the path is coming together. You're experiencing the Noble Eightfold Path, yeah? And in a, in a sense, there's a much more beautiful way of thinking about the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, otherwise, it becomes a theoretical framework. It becomes something abstract. It becomes like, this is what you do. But actually, when it comes to, when, if it is an experiential thing, yeah? It is actually, in many ways, much more interesting. And it's much more immediately obvious whether we are practicing the path or not. We can recognize things in a far more immediate and direct way than if it is simply a theoretical framework in which it ends up just as a kind of intellectual idea. So what I want to do now, I want to gradually turn to the experience of the noble way full path, how we experience this in meditation and practice, how this path unfolds. Yeah? We have seen how it starts off with uh, being with the noble ones. So what comes after that? So I'm going to look now at a, a, a sutta, which has become a little bit well-known, in particular because uh, uh, Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi has talked about this sutta and written about it. It is known as the uh, Upanisa Sutta. Uh, translated here by Bhante Sujato as a vital condition. And um, uh, this sutta, again, found in the connected discourses of the Buddha, the uh, Nidana Sanyutta, the, the connected discourses on causation, which is the 12th chapter in that collection. And this is the 23rd sutta. And it shows us a, a, a connection yeah, with between dependent origination and then another sequence which starts where dependent origination ends. If you remember back to what we were looking at before, we were looking at dependent origination and we went back to ignorance at the beginning of dependent origination. And then we asked the question, well, what happened before ignorance? Why is there ignorance? Why is there delusion? And we took that back all the way to lack of seeing noble people. Now we're doing the opposite. We, are, we, we have dependent origination. We go to the other end of dependent origination, which is suffering, yeah? which is the result of all of this. And then we go beyond the suffering and say, well, what happens after suffering? Yeah? How does this evolve further? Or how can it evolve if we are in the right place, if you're thinking about this in the right way? So this is an alternative way of thinking about this. So, so um, um, the sutta then starts out with, again, avinsha, ignorance or delusion. Yeah? So let me just run through the factors of dependent origination one more time, just briefly, simply because they happen to be here. Yeah? So here it says ignorance is a vital condition for choices. Yeah? Because we are deluded about the world, because we think we know where happiness is, because we think we have, it is in our power to create that happiness for ourselves. We act in the world to create happiness. And that activity is here, the choices that we make. Sometimes we make good choices coming from a good heart. Other times we make bad choices coming from negative, coming from defilements instead. And in this way, we create good and bad karma, which affects the state of our consciousness. Yeah? Either feeling bright, or feeling more dark inside. 
And the sum total of that compound that we make decides, if you like, the level of our consciousness. And that level of our consciousness is then where the mind, the consciousness, it's called the station of consciousness, decides roughly where you get reborn. Once you are reborn, you will experience the world according to that rebirth. Yes, that's why we have choices are a vital condition for consciousness. Consciousness is a vital condition for name and form. You experience that world in a certain way, name and form. Your mental qualities and your physical qualities have a certain shape depending on where you are reborn. Then you experience the world through the six senses in that realm. Uh, because of the senses, you experience the world through those senses, uh, and then you feel the world because of those experiences, good, bad. I'm going to say good, bad, who knows, but that wouldn't be quite right. <laughs> good, bad, or neutral, right? Uh, good, bad, or neutral. And then we crave, uh, depending on that. Uh, yeah, it's just in the nature of feeling that we want the good ones, we don't want the bad ones. Uh, because we crave uh, and then take up certain strategies and certain uh, certain ways of living to satisfy that craving. This is the upadana, the taking up of things and to satisfy our cravings. And then that upadana, the taking up of things, leads to a certain way of exist existence. We exist in a certain way, depending on what we take up. Yeah, We exist in the sensory realm or we exist in a higher meditation realm. It is It has to do with the inclination of, of our mind. What does our mind inclined to that? And then when our mind inclines in a certain way, it tends to get reborn where it, where it uh, inclines. And then when you are reborn, you are stuffed. Yeah, that's it. Rebirth, it's too late, nothing you can do. Uh, you can try to make the world a little bit brighter, a little bit better. But basically now you are going to have to deal with life just like everyone else. And that is why the consequence of rebirth uh, as it says here, rebirth is the vital condition for suffering, as it says here. So we have arrived at suffering yeah, through these 12 factors of dependent origination. Now, what happens when we suffer? And I should say that uh, there is two usual possible outcomes of suffering. Yeah. And here, especially suffering when it becomes quite acute, yeah, like let's say that you lose someone who is very dear to you or something happens in your life which causes tremendous problems for you, whatever it might be, yeah, then there's two ways of reacting to that suffering. Yeah. One way, the Buddha says, is you become deluded. Yeah. You become foolish. Yeah. You lose your sense of what is appropriate and what is wrong. Yeah. And we know many people in the world, they become silly when they suffer a lot. Yeah. Yeah. They think of drinking alcohol or abusing drugs or they kind of lock themselves in a room. They don't want to deal with the world anymore or whatever it is. Uh, a lot of suffering. Sometimes it makes people, unfortunately, very act very foolishly because of that suffering. Yeah. So this is a kind of a natural problem, natural uh, natural way of acting. There is no solution. If you don't know what to do with the suffering of life, then of course you try to drown out the suffering by using some sort of a suppressant that suppresses all those negative feelings. It is a natural thing to do. So uh, very often, you know, we need to have a lot of compassion in this world because uh, people often do all of these things that people do, whether they abuse drugs or alcohol or whatever they do, they do it usually because uh, life is often painful for people. Uh, these are more like illnesses than anything else. Uh, and uh, so that is one thing. But if you are a person uh, who has some kind of spiritual input in your life, uh, if you are a person who has thought about life in a slightly deeper way, if you had the good fortune to come across the Buddhist teachings and to understand that it is the nature of life that these things will happen, uh, then when these difficult situations come, you will be much better prepared yeah? and you will be ready, hopefully, even to use the difficult situations uh, as grist for the mill to enable you to even become a little better person because it will give you a possibility of reflecting on life, uh, understanding its downside and then, um, uh, and then um, becoming even more committed, if you like, to 
to a spiritual path uh, because you understand that this is really the only way out. Uh, so that is the alternative. Yeah? If we suffer, it leads to more faith, more confidence in the Buddhist teachings, uh, more ability to live in the right way. And this is what we are seeing in this particular sequence here. Suffering is a vital condition for faith. So um, this does not mean that you have to suffer a lot to have faith. Yeah? It would, <laughs> that would be kind of terrible. You have to suffer enormously to have confidence in the teachings. It doesn't mean that. What, what it means is that um, uh, sometimes people need suffering to have faith, but uh, it is also sufficient to just to realize the nature of life. Because if you realize the nature of life, then you understand enough about suffering for faith to arise. So it is more like this has, is an aspect of right humor. It's an aspect of insight, understanding life as it actually is. Yeah, this is really what this is about. More than actually experiencing suffering is to understand the nature of life, to see other people suffer, yeah? to understand that you are in exactly the same position as other people. Yeah, we're all basically in the same boat. Uh, yeah, being human means we have so much in common. It doesn't really matter the things that we are different, are different between us are so tiny compared to the vast, the vast majority of things that we have in common as human beings. Uh, and once you see that, so you start to get an insight. And this is what the Buddha did. Yeah? Remember when he started out, he was... Um, seeing and reflecting on precisely death, old age, and illness, yeah, the nature of existence. And that was what actually made him become a monk and then realize awakening. Yeah. So it is the insight into these things that matter. Yeah. When you get that inner, when you understand what suffering is about, yeah, this is really what matters. Yeah. The faith, the confidence in the Buddhist teachings arise, especially because the Buddhist teachings address these problems head on. This is what Buddhism is about. Yeah. And then something very interesting happens, yeah, once that faith comes in, because now suddenly there is hope, yeah, suddenly there is, wow, there is a solution to this. Yeah? And that is why from that faith, faith is the vital condition for joy. Yeah, this is what you have here. It's a vital condition for joy because you realize you can be one day, you can be in the depths of despair and then suddenly because you understand there is a solution, you can turn over it just like that. Yeah, and suddenly everything is everything has changed because you know that actually there is a solution to this. And uh, so faith is that faith and confidence, especially in the teachings of the Buddha. You have the reminder that you have this uh, uh, this teacher who has the, the, the insight into the full insight into the human condition, uh, who understands suffering and happiness all the way. Uh, all to, in all its extent in the human realm, uh, uh, who has the ability to teach in such a beautiful way, uh, that the Dhamma teaching is still available in the world, all of these kind of things. Uh, and uh, you can go from despair to sense of joy so fast uh, if you understand the treasure that you have in your hands when you're reading the suttas or on your screen or whatever it is uh, when you're seeing the suttas. Uh, so this is uh, the power of this, yeah? understanding that uh, we have the solution to the problem. Uh, so joy comes from faith. Uh, joy also comes from other things. We'll see later on that joy also comes from, um, uh, you know, uh, virtue specifically or morality specifically. But in this particular sutta, it is faith that is kind of highlighted as, as a joy. I will show you, we'll show you in greater detail later on how that faith can be developed to actually give rise to these positive qualities. Yeah, and then once the joy has arisen, well, then there is this whole path of development. Yeah, and um, now what we're looking at now is really the meditation path. Yeah, the path that happens when you close your eyes and you can continue to dwell on the faith, dwell on the qualities of the Buddha, and that may be sufficient for the joy to become even more powerful and then transform into even more powerful states. Or it may be that you want to join that uh, contemplation yeah, of the Buddha Dhamma, join that with perhaps uh, watching the breath, maybe. Yeah, you can join that up somehow uh, and to make it more, have, have a clearer focus perhaps uh, and then develop the meditation in that way. There's many things you can do here, uh, but uh, 
here we are now entering really the realm of meditation because this is where you're most likely to develop the mind in this particular way. Yeah, so let me just read out, first of all, exactly what happens in this realm of meditation. Yeah, so first of all, faith is a vital condition for joy. Joy is a vital condition for rapture. Rapture is a vital condition for tranquility. Tranquility is a vital condition for bliss. Bliss is a vital condition for immersion. Stillness. Stillness is a vital condition for truly knowing and seeing. Truly knowing and seeing is a vital for disillusionment or even aversion, you could say. Aversion is a vital condition for dispassion. Dispassion is a vital condition for freedom. And freedom is a, a vital condition for the knowledge of ending. Kaye Nyana at the very end there. So this is the sequence of meditation. Yeah? And as you can see that almost all of this has to do, as I said before, with what happens in our personal experience. It is, if you like, the psychology of meditation practice, how ideally we should experience meditation. And if you look at that, it is a pretty impressive list of qualities. Yeah? There's joy, there is rapture, there is bliss. <laughs> yeah? in, a, in a fairly short list of about 10 factors, yeah? there's three right there which just stand out as just happiness all the way through. Yeah? Then there is tranquility. And tranquility, of course, is also just a, a particular kind of happiness, if you like it. Then there is uh, immersion or samadhi or stillness, uh, yeah, which is another kind of tranquility and bliss. Yeah? Samadhi means the unification of the mind. In other words, complete tranquility, non-distractedness is actually one way it is defined in the suttas. Uh, yeah, so you, you start to look at this. This is all the kind of beginning of the path. The last part here is all about insight, but up until the point of insight, uh, this is what you're seeing. It's all about two things, really. Uh, one is the happiness, the bliss of the path, uh, and the other one is the tranquility, the calm, and the peace of the path. Uh, these are the two factors. Uh, and if you ever want to measure your meditation, uh, if you want to have some idea of whether you're heading in the right direction or not, uh, these are the two qualities you should watch out for. Uh, yeah? The meditation, as it develops, it develops greater and greater degrees of happiness or bliss or whatever you, you want to call it. And on the other hand, it develops ever deeper states of tranquility and calm. So these are the two ways we can measure, we can know whether our meditation is becoming deeper or not. Tranquility on the one hand, bliss or happiness on the other hand. Yeah, one after the other. And um, when you see when you see this, this is such a beautiful uh, counterpoint to the idea of suffering. Buddhism is all about suffering. What do you mean Buddhism is all about suffering? It's all about happiness. That's what it says here. How can it be about suffering when there's so much happiness in it? What are you talking about? And so this is a very important counterpoint because it shows us that when we, the way, what, what the Buddha talks about as suffering is almost impossible for us to understand. Yeah. From our ordinary point of view, actually, the path of meditation is supremely happy. Yeah, there's blisses in this sequence here that you have never, ever experienced in your entire life before. It is so incredibly powerful. Very few people go to the very end of this path and experience this bliss at the highest level because it is just so overpowering and amazing. And you realize that, you know, that, that you start really to realize there's something extraordinary about this Buddhist path. So uh, it's such an important counterpoint uh, because it shows us that when we talk about the Four Noble Truths, uh, we talk about suffering and the cause of suffering, sometimes it is just too profound for us really to understand what is going on. Uh, from our personal experience, this, what we are seeing here, is a more uh, natural way of understanding uh, the Buddhist path. This is a more immediate way to comprehend it that everyone can really comprehend, at least to some extent, uh, even though some of these experiences are otherworldly, 
that are beyond our ordinary um, faculties, and still they are, we have a ballpark idea of what this means. So the Buddhist path is just so amazing, yeah? And you can see here, there's nothing really here about it. contemplating negative feelings or painful feelings, yeah? There's just bliss after bliss after bliss. And, and when we come to the Anapasati Sutta later on, uh, which shows us this whole path in roughly the same way, but with a slightly alternative uh, um, a framework, and again, we will see there's nothing there about contemplating pain or anything like that. Uh, it is all about developing happiness. Uh, all about developing tranquility. Yeah. And then out of that tranquility and happiness, yeah, towards the very end there, after immersion, then comes all the insights, yeah, truly knowing and seeing. Yeah. You have the power of the mind that enables you to truly see and know the nature of the world. And then comes these things we call this heat called disillusion, yeah, because you see suffering now you start to see suffering after all the happiness yeah that's when you understand suffering yeah? <laughs> kind of paradoxical isn't it you experience the highest happiness in the world and only then do you understand suffering kind of interesting isn't it yeah? suffering can only be understood in the light of the most highest happiness available to human beings yeah? so you understand that you get disillusioned you reject things and then afterwards you become dispassionate and yeah, it means you lose interest in the world, you reject, you reject things, and then you, at, at the very end, you reach free, freedom from all of this. And from that freedom, you have the knowledge that things have come to an end. You know that you are an Arahant. So this is this uh, extraordinary path of Buddhism, yeah? this kind of exceptional path of meditation. So the Buddha, the way the Buddha teaches meditation is just so utterly positive. Uh, there's nothing there not to be liked, basically. Yeah. So let's, let's have a look at this in a little bit more detail. One of the, I think, important things to realize here, which is actually very important in the sequence, is that the insights that you have at the very end, yeah, that depend on happiness, yeah? It is, there's no such thing here as, uh, as you, know, you, you know, what some people call dry insight. Uh, dry is like gray or boring insight. Uh, yeah, insight with no kind of uh, oomph to it. Uh, all insight, according to this, happens on the basis of happiness. Uh, you need that happiness to be able to settle the mind and draw it together. And only then can insight really happen. Uh, this is, I think, a very important point to draw out of this. Uh, yeah, it, all of this happens through joy and happiness and that is where it comes from and all of that joy and happiness it kind of comes together in the experience of samadhi and through that experience of samadhi one of the very important points that this is making making is that truly knowing and seeing only happens on the basis of samadhi it doesn't happen without that yeah it is a vital condition for knowing and seeing it and um, this, this particular framework, this particular way of presenting the Dhamma is something that you see in so many different places in the suttas. Uh, you see it repeated in the, uh, the mindfulness of breathing. You see it repeated largely in the seven factors of awakening. Uh, you see it repeated in a variety of different contexts and ways. Uh, this is a very, very important framework. Uh, yeah? It is something that uh, exists in uh, parallel suttas translated into Chinese over 2,000 years ago, and it is still almost verbatim the same as the Pali. Yeah, so this is very clearly a teaching deriving from the Buddha. I don't, I don't think there can be any doubt about that. And what he's saying is that knowledge and vision, seeing things according to reality, which would be stream entry, for example, maybe even lesser insight, it depends on one thing, on samadhi. Samadhi, the ability to unify the mind, is absolutely critical for this to happen. So what is Samadhi in the suttas? And uh, what you will know in the suttas is that uh, uh, the main way that Samadhi is always explained, uh, you know, Samma Samadhi on the Noble Eightfold Path, yeah, is always the four jhanas. So if you want any 
proof, or maybe not proof, maybe proof is too strong a word, if you want any strong indication from the suttas uh, that samadhi is required for real insight, uh, it doesn't get any stronger than this. Uh, yeah, this is almost saying that you have to have a jhana experience to have any real insight. It is one of the things that often come up in, in the circles, and I, I don't really want to spend too much time on it. I think the question itself is not really all that interesting. But uh, if, if you are interested, in that, this is the kind of argument that is very obviously the case. We need something very powerful to be able to see very powerful mind to be able to see and know reality as it actually is. Uh, yeah, one of those very important points here. Yeah. But let us go through this in a little bit more detail, just to give you a feeling for what is going on here. We're going to look at these factors later on as well. So, uh, um, uh, but to have a feeling for this. Yeah, so from faith arises joy. Uh, yeah, and the joy we're talking about here, pamuja, can be any kind of gladness that you're feeling inside of, inside of yourself. Yeah, you feel glad. This can happen in ordinary daily life. You just feel happy to be alive. You feel that you're living well. You feel that you have the Buddha to guide you in this life. And you feel a sense of this uplift inside. Yeah, you kind of have a little spring in your step because you feel glad inside. I'm sure you're all know what when I say this. Yeah, there's a gladness which you feel buoyant and you feel light and you feel uh, you feel something positive is happening in, in, in you. Uh, and then as you develop that gladness, you're based on that initial faith. Uh, and again, this happens usually through meditation practice. Uh, that gladness moves into something more powerful uh, that is often experienced. Physically, can be experienced physically, it doesn't have to be, but can be experienced physically as, you know, as the waves of the joy kind of almost coursing through the body. Uh, yeah, it can be physical. Uh, it can also be more mental. This will vary a little bit from person to person. That's what, they, what they're saying. Uh, but it's more powerful than the previous ones. So you're developing this happiness. Uh, yeah, and now it is already starting to move out of the ordinary experience of the world. Uh, is already becoming a little bit otherworldly because these are not ordinary experience that people have. People have gladness sometimes in ordinary life, but now we're moving into a higher kind of happiness that is not so common. This is much more common in meditation than anywhere else. It started to become very delightful. Yeah, you feel like energized, you feel almost electric when these things happen. There's something very pleasurable about this. And this is only the beginning. Yeah? Then, as you carry on watching your breath or whatever it is that you're doing, uh, those coarser aspects of these feelings, uh, they start to die down a little bit. Uh, yeah? You become more tranquil because you're watching the breath, you're allowing things to unify. The body is disappearing a little bit more into the background. Uh, you don't feel that piti, which is the word for rapture. It becomes much more peaceful instead. Uh, and the quality of the mind is more subtle. Uh, the happiness you have is more refined than the previous one. It is also more intense, yeah? It is also more powerful, but more refined in a sense, uh, because the body is fading away into the background. Uh, so more happiness, uh, more tranquility. Uh. And at this point, we gain this kind of tranquility, uh, yeah? Where the body really calms down and the mind also becomes incredibly peaceful. Uh, it starts to feel like you can sit in this place forever now. Uh. It's a feeling that you don't want to do anything else in your entire life. You'll be happy to sit like a rock on this chair until eternity. That's what it starts to feel like. Of course, you probably wouldn't uh, when eternity is a long way away. away from it, you know, it becomes a point you get fed up of sitting on this chair, but it can, it feels like that at that time. Yeah, you could do this forever because it's just so contented, it is just so solid. You're feeling like this mountain that cannot be moved and you don't want to be moved. And uh, of course, because you are so utterly contented, uh, the bliss becomes even more refined, yeah? even more subtle as a consequence of that. Uh, and this is what here is called the bliss faculty. So the main point here of this whole sequence uh, is not, it's not perhaps so easy to explain exactly how these things are experienced. Uh, the main point is that the bliss is ever increasing. Yeah? The tranquility is becoming ever more deep, ever more calm, ever more beautiful. Yeah? 
And uh, as you do this, because the whole experience of the world at this point is so overwhelmingly positive, uh, your mind focuses in on this. The mind doesn't want to do anything else. Yeah, it just wants to stay with the happiness, stay with what you're doing. Yeah? And that is why samadhi can happen at this point, uh, because your mind is no longer distracted. There's nothing else in the world that you're interested in. Uh, you're only interested in the object in front of you right now, which is what? Which is basically bliss. That's basically what it is. Uh, you can look at it from different angles, but the idea of bliss here is the essential ingredient of that particular experience. Uh, samadhi happens because there's nothing else you're interested in the whole world. Uh, and this is why the happiness is so important. Uh, yeah? If you don't have happiness, uh, there is no way you're going to be able to unify the mind. You won't be able to get the samadhi that empowers the mind, makes it so solid, uh, but later on, you can actually have those inside experiences. Happiness is crucial to enable samadhi to happen. Without it, it can't happen. In any way, samadhi itself is a state of even more happiness. Yeah? And uh, this is where you start to enter the otherworldly happiness, where this sensory realm is left behind. And you start to experience things that you have never even dreamt of were possible to experience. Or maybe you have experienced them sometime a long, long time ago, but they have kind of left behind because it's so many lifetimes ago. But now you're moving into a different level, a different area, a different kind of reality, which you basically had no idea could possibly even exist. And when you come out of this samadhi, then that is when the mind is empowered, it has the happiness, it has the stability to actually be able to see through uh, the delusion that normally we have. Uh, this delusion is so powerful because this delusion has to do with our very identity, who we think we are. Yeah? And because you're challenging basically who you think you are, uh, it is very hard to see through that. Through that. Uh, there's all these defense mechanisms inside of us. Uh, yeah, you can't. What do you mean? You, you, you're going to take away my self. Uh, what on earth are you doing here? And uh, of course, that can be very scary, yeah? And so for that reason, you need an extraordinarily powerful mind to be able to deal with that. Uh, that is why samadhi here is so important to be able to see things, as it says here, truly knowing and seeing. Yeah? So um, uh, then once you truly know and see, well, what is it that you truly know and see? Well, what you truly know and see is suffering yeah and because you truly know and see suffering well then you are no longer interested in the world because you understand it is all really very problematic yeah that is what the insight is insight is always into the three characteristics impermanence suffering and non-self but here the suffering thing is the one that kind of makes the most sense because once you understand the nature of suffering in the world of course you have a version. You, you don't want to have anything to do with, any, any, do with it anymore. It's like hot coals in your hand, and all you want to do is let go of it as soon as you possibly can. So this disillusionment, the aversion to the world happens. And if you keep on doing that long enough, coming back to this, actually craving for all the things in the world must die down. This is the dispassion part. And we're craving for the world dies down, then eventually you are liberated from all of this. And then you know that you have come to the end of the knowledge of ending, yeah? the knowledge of the ending of samsara, the knowledge of the ending of suffering, and the knowledge that you are an arahant. So this is uh, this path, and you can see that um, you know the, sometimes we talk about the deeper aspects of the Dhamma too early. Yeah? We can see that the only way you can really fully understand what the three characteristics are about is after so much bliss, so much peace, yeah, that it almost blows your mind how much bliss and peace you're having. Yeah. So that is the right time to understand these things. And if you try to understand these things too much beforehand, and that is why people sometimes get put off the Buddhist teachings, because they're starting on the end. They're starting trying to understand something that is actually impossible to understand with an ordinary mind. So this kind of gives you an idea of the, uh, the problem here. Now, one last thing before we go over to the questions and answers. 
I just wanted to comment here on the uh, translation because you see here you have a the word samadhi is here translated as immersion. Yeah, and uh, this is a, a speci speciality of uh, Bhante Sujato. This is his translation of this. Uh, uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi translates it as concentration, which is probably, in my opinion, and, and it's a word Ajahn Brahm has banned from being used as a translation for Samadhi because it gives really the completely the wrong idea, the idea of grasping something and concentrating, forcing your mind. That's usually how people think about concentration. Then. Uh, but the way Ajahn Brahm translates, which I really like, is as stillness. That is my preferred translation because stillness to me, is kind of emotion, it's a word that is emotionally sensible. You understand what it means. You intuit it straight away what stillness actually means. So, so I think stillness is really a good translation. So what about immersion then? Does that, is that a good translation? And uh, I think the best way to regard this, the idea of a word like immersion, is to um, see it as an expansion on uh, what the word samadhi actually means. Yeah? And the idea of samadhi is to kind of go within yourself, let go of the external senses, withdraw into your shell. You are immersed in your own little world, yeah? letting go of the external things. And in this sense, immersion is, is, a, is quite a nice word if you understand what it alludes to here. But if you don't understand what it alludes to, then it can seem maybe a little bit intellectual, so a little bit cold or meaningless. But if you understand the background here, it actually is quite a beautiful way of thinking about the idea of samadhi, being within yourself. You know, Ajahn Shah has this beautiful idea of uh, your uh, real home. Yeah, the real home is really the samadhi experience, when you withdraw from the world and you can find that safety within it, where you are no longer touched by all the problems of the world and all the uh, suffering that exists in that realm, and you withdraw into your home, feeling happy, feeling peaceful, feeling uh, kind of safe from all the things outside there. So in that sense, I think immersion kind of works as a, as a translation. Yeah. But um, the main point here for me is just to uh, point out that the way that the Buddha teaches meditation, uh, and uh, we can compare this also to the Satipatthana Sutta, uh, but uh, you will see here that the emphasis in, is only almost exclusively on positive things. Actually, it is exclusively on positive things. There's nothing here which can be regarded as a negative experience in any way. Uh, and this is the promise of the Buddha. Uh, and this is the promise that if you, each one of us, practices this path properly, each one of us is capable of achieving all of these things. Uh, it's just a matter of commitment. Uh, it's a matter of perseverance, but these things are there for the taking. Taking is the wrong word, it sounds very greedy. They are there, they are available to us if we practice these things in the right way. Yeah? And uh, we're going to continue over the next phase just to expand on this again and again and again, and to find out how can we actually achieve this? How can we achieve all of these bits and qualities? So hopefully each one of you will be able to achieve some of these things, at the very least, on this Buddhist path. Okay, so that is the uh, suttas uh, for now. So, uh, Venerable Chanda, would you like to uh, fire away some questions? Uh? Yes, wonderful. Without harming you, it sounds like firing a gun or something. <laughs> firing the flowers at you. <laughs> so yeah. the first question is uh, thank you for confirming my observation that the true teachings of the Buddha are on a downward trend with the word secular added to the practices and teachings many thanks for the longer period of meditation this morning so not really a question but if you'd like to say anything about okay. that yeah, that's marvelous yeah that's, that is uh, thank you for the kind comments it's always nice to hear kind comments and uh, I agree with you. I think the, uh, the secular Buddhism is a, uh, is, uh, it, it depends on what happens with secular Buddhism. Right? It, it is missing some very important parts of what Buddhism really is about. And they often they throw out rebirth, often they throw out the monastic Sangha, and often they throw out enlightenment and awakening. And, and you wonder what is left 
once you throw out all those things. Um, but uh, it could be that technology is, is a stepping stone. Yeah, it is kind of a starting point. They kind of uh, grasping the um, things that are acceptable in our modern society, modern people. A certain thing we just cannot accept certain people. So hopefully that is what it is. And then down the track, I know of many people who are used to the secular Buddhists who became more full Buddhist over time. So it may just be, a, I hope it is like a, a stepping stone that actually will then uh, take these people further down the track. And there's, you know, there's lots of interesting things happening in the world. If you look at also the world of science, a secular Buddhist, for example, they would argue that you know, the scientific outlook doesn't allow for rebirth. But, but actually, there's all kinds of interesting things happening in the scientific world, which is like, changing these things. Our outlook, our understanding of the mind is being updated all the time. And, and uh, as, you know, I, I don't think we sh should rely on science because we never know where science is going to go. But uh, I think it is quite possible that the scientific outlook too will align at least a little bit more with Buddhist ideas in the future. So who knows what's going to happen? I think uh, it is uh, it, both dangerous, but also it is not perhaps quite as bleak as it may seem. Okay. 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 Uh, back to the top. Dear Ajahn, do you have any recommendations as to how to balance developing spiritually while staying somewhat up to date with current affairs of the five sense world? Should one even try to stay up to date? <laughs> uh, it, is, it is up to you. You, uh, it, you know, there isn't any right or wrong in this. Uh, sometimes it can be to stay a little bit up to date because uh, uh, for two reasons. One is just to remind you that the world is not going anywhere. It's the same old thing happening again and again. And, you know, the same plot, basically, in the world. Nothing has ever changed. It just reminds you of the suffering. And if you use that idea in the right way, yeah, if you use the, the, the news to actually remind you of the nature of reality, well, then it can be a spur to practice sometimes. Yeah, you, not, nothing has really changed and it kind of turns you off the world. So occasionally seeing the news, knowing what's going on can be, can be useful. It is also the case, uh, you know, as a, as a monastic, you get asked all kinds of questions about all sorts of tricky issues. Uh, and uh, sometimes it can be kind of nice to know kind of the policies that are being, um, you know, being established in a certain society, you know, things about maybe, uh, you know, ethical dilemmas, for example, like euthanasia and that kind of stuff. And, and uh, so sometimes it can be handy to know a little bit about what's happening in society around us. So, so we can add a Buddhist perspective on some of the ethical dilemmas. Uh, and I think that is very important. I think Buddhism has a lot of interesting things to say in areas such as, uh, you know, uh, assisted dying, for example, or, uh, uh, you know, whatever it might be, because it, we have a more flexible moral system than other religions. Uh, we have a moral system that is based on intention, motivation, rather than based on absolute rules. Uh, and uh, that gives us more ability to say something useful in these kind of debates. Uh, and this is what is so, so beautiful things about the Buddhism is precisely its uh, ethical system. Uh, so, uh, but you know, it's really entirely up to you. You don't have to. If you find that it uses you and it turns you off, it don't don't have anything to do with it. Turn it off. And yeah, you don't. You know, it's just a, it's just a really a matter of um, personal preference. I think whether you want to see some news or you don't want to see any news. Okay. Uh, I'm just trying to find questions from people who haven't asked much yet. So someone's asking, at what stage are the thoughts completely gone from the mind? At what stage has thought completely gone from the mind? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, uh, that would, yeah, okay. So that depends on what you mean by thought. Uh, I mean, thought is a very slippery customer. Yeah, thoughts, they, they uh, thoughts can manifest in so many different different ways and you have the kind of the more obvious thinking where you are verbalizing and you're kind of having conversations in your head you know that's kind of one very obvious thought 
but then you have thoughts that are more picture-like. Yeah, you're thinking in pictures, seeing images inside of you. They are also thoughts. So how do we define a thought? And I think one of the kind of obvious ways of defining a thought is like a movement of the mind. When there is change happening inside of you, yeah, you're moving from one idea to another. There is a flow going on. And yeah, the verbalization obviously is a flow. If you're seeing a movie in your head, well, again, it's like a flow, yeah? And uh, so if we define it as a movement of the mind, yeah, then uh, the final ending of that movement of the mind ha happens in the second jhana. That's where it happens. Uh, that is where the mind becomes absolutely still. There's no movement whatsoever. So the second jhana is... Um, called samadhi jhana, born of samadhi. This is the true samadhi, the true stillness of the mind, where there's no, nothing happening at all. Right? But uh, even in the first jhana, you're not really thinking. Yeah? There might be, there is like a vestige of the movement of the mind, but you would not call it thinking in the normal way. Yeah? There's no pictures, there's no words, no, it's just a kind of tiny bit of a, you know, um, shifting in your perception, if you like. Um, but uh, so, so that could be considered a residual thought, if you like, and that is why in the suttas it is defined, it is called vitaka vichara, which actually are words that usually mean thought, because it is a residual thought, but it's not thought in the normal sense. So that is really where the thinking stops. But of course, even if you are really enjoying the breath, yeah, and you are kind of uh, really happy and you are maybe seeing some lights in the mind or you're enjoying the bliss or whatever. Already at that point, there's going to be a little thinking going on. Uh, maybe there will be a stray thought occasionally far away, which will just dissipate very, very fast. Uh, but already at that point, you are not uh, very, very little is going on in the mind. Uh, so it's a gradual process, but the, the final ending is really in the second jhana. Thank you, Ajahn. So another question about bliss. Once we reach a state of bliss, wouldn't we want others to feel the same too and stop suffering? How not to get lost in that state so that one doesn't go further on the path? In other words, how not to stop there, I think. Yeah, yeah. So, so the question is basically how to get sidetracked by teaching others, is that, is that the question? I'm not quite sure. I think. Um, they're saying first, there's two different questions, I think. So if we reach that state of bliss, wouldn't we want others to feel the same? And then the second question is a bit different. Um, how do we not get lost in that state so that we don't go further on the path? Okay. In other words, how, how not to stop yourself going further? Okay. So yes, of course, you want other people to feel the same. Absolutely. And this is one of the reasons why people become teachers, yeah? People like Ajahn Brahm, you know, one of the, he doesn't really like to hang out with people very much. He doesn't like to uh, do very much in the world. There's one thing that he really enjoys, and that is to teach the Dhamma, because he, that is just extraordinarily inspiring. And he wants to share those experiences that he has on the path with other people, because he knows that there's some, something really, really worthwhile to be taught to the entire world. So absolutely, you want to share with other people. And uh, this is why a monastic really has two roles. That is their own practice and the teaching of others. Yeah. So, and I would recommend you too, if you are getting some good meditation and you would like to teach a little bit, great, go for it. Because when you teach, you learn so much yourself. This is one of the things I have discovered in my life, how much I learn by teaching Yeah, and how kind of uplifting as well. You feel that you're doing something good. You feel that you're helping other people and, and uh, you know, not take yourself too seriously with it. You, and, and then you just, uh, it's actually uplifting. It's a very positive experience. It's a great learning experience. It reminds you, it makes you think about practice. So you get into the details. It, you know, it, it helps you uncover the problems that you may have even in your own practice when you talk about these things. Uh, so it's a wonderful thing to do. So absolutely. Uh, but how do you stop yourself from stopping? Well, if you use the teaching experience in the right way, it will be supportive of your practice. Yeah. If you use it in the wrong way, it might become a blockage. So don't use it to boost your ego. Don't boost, don't use it to boast about your own attainments. Use it to because you have compassion for others. The other part there is to 
uh, not get lost in the bliss yeah and not allow the bliss to stop you in the practice uh, the way to do that is just to remind yourself that you want to go deeper uh, take the bliss to a new level uh, yeah if you have experienced some bliss remember there's more yeah there's more down the track yeah? take it all the way to the point of deep samadhi uh, so don't be satisfied with anything don't think that what you have now is good enough uh, if you're not an arahant you should not be satisfied yeah so keep on going for the big goal on the horizon, the Arahant chip, uh, then you are on the right track. Yeah? Never be satisfied with anything short of the, of the goal. So if you have bliss, uh, say, well, what comes after that? Uh, how can I have more bliss? Uh, how can I use this to get some insight into the nature of reality? Yeah? And uh, then uh, you, so you motivate yourself. Otherwise, uh, you just get reborn somewhere, you may be very happy, and then down the track you may suffer again. Yeah? You don't want to do that. You want to uh, make sure you take this as far as you possibly can. Right. Okay. okay. Um, why is it that I had the strongest nimittas just before sleep? My head wobbled for a while. Has meditation any similarities with sleep? Uh, yes, it does. <laughs> it does. Yes, yeah, sleep and uh, meditation has has quite a lot in common because. Uh, when you go to sleep, you have to let go. Yeah, if you uh, if you are thinking too much or too many things happening in mind, then uh, you, you don't fall asleep very often. You toss and turn until you know until you kind of the thinking somehow stops. So there is actually something in common. It is the letting go idea. So um, it is possible. One of the ways of kind of doing meditation is actually to imagine yourself going to sleep. Yeah. But you have to be very careful because uh, if, you, <laughs> if, you get, if you do that wrong, well, you actually will go to sleep. So you have to do the going to sleep without actually going to sleep. You have to do the letting go part, uh, but not the sleeping part. Yeah, that's kind of the trick there. So there is that similarity. So try, yeah, I mean, if you have, as you say, if you get nimitized just before you go to sleep, that's very interesting. Try to use that in the meditation, yeah, because that is exactly what you want to do in your meditation. So imagine yourself precisely going to sleep. For you, it might be exactly the right thing to do, huh? yeah, because you get the, you are there but on the right track already. Huh? So uh, yes, try it out and see what happens. And if you do, you know, this might actually be a, a good way for you to do get some good meditation in your practice. It is not so ideal to get nimittas just before you go to sleep because sometimes the nimitta will keep you awake. Yeah, if they're really bright nimitta, it can be really hard to sleep afterwards because your mind is so bright and so joyous or whatever that it's so energized that a really energetic mind doesn't usually want to go to sleep. So take it into your meditation instead and then you have you have far more be far more useful for you now. Okay. Okay, another one about deep meditation. If you can't think in jhana, but you can subsequently recall the experience, then memory must be operating within jhana. What is memory in Buddhist psychology? So, uh, oh, yes, memory is because it is, you are very, very conscious. Yeah, you have a very powerful awareness and, and anything that you are powerfully aware of, you will remember it. And if you even if you look at something which is completely still and you don't think about it, even just in ordinary life, you will still remember it because it is a powerful imprint in the mind. And if you have a jhana experience or a deep samadhi experience, that is such an extraordinarily powerful imprint of the mind that you won't even be able to forget it. Yeah, these are the kind of experience you remember years after it happened literally decades after it happened, you never forget these experiences. And I remember many years ago, Ajahn Ram called the meditation, deep meditation experience, a positive trauma. Yeah, and that is such a, such a really descriptive idea because trauma, we normally think about something negative, yeah? Something you can't forget, it kind of recurs in your consciousness, like nightmares recurring or whatever. But this is the exact opposite. It is an experience that is so happy, so powerful, so unified, so still, so peaceful, that you will never ever forget it again because it, you understand that you are in the vicinity of the meaning of life. You have uncovered something that is so extraordinary 
that you always want to go back there afterwards. Though. And this is such quite a common thing, actually. I've met so many people who have had this kind of experiences and they have just blown their mind so much uh, that they can't get it out of their mind again. They're drawn towards you know, the monastic life and drawn towards spiritual experiences of trying to get these experiences. Uh, and that is where they go wrong, trying to get them. Because when you try to get things, uh, that is not how the Buddhist path works. Buddhist path works through letting go. Uh, so you have to know how to approach the reattainment of these things. Uh, uh, but um, uh, yes, so uh, <laughs> where am I going with this kind of all that? Um, I think the next follow-up part was what is the understanding of memory in Buddhism? Right, okay, what is the memory? Right, so, uh, so me memory in Buddhism is just really, you know, it's, it's really very much like memory. It's psychology. Like it's the kind of association of things. Yeah, you associate something, and sometimes a memory imprint like this can be so incredibly powerful that it overpowers the mind, and so it sits in the mind like this imprint that is there. But uh, other aspects of memory are, uh, I think, has to have to do with association. Yeah, you associate things, uh, and then you um, kind of get into a certain mood or mode of, of the mind uh, because that association. Sometimes you go to a place. Place has a vibe or a feeling to it that brings up the memory from the distant past. Yeah, I'm sure everyone has experienced that sometimes. It can just be a smell in the room or a feeling about the place, and it kind of reminds you of your childhood or something like that. It's kind of weird, so it's kind of associative. And I think that is also in part how karma works. Yeah, if you have done some bad things in the past, and then you come into a situation in the future that somehow reminds you of that then the um, feelings, the negative feelings with that may also come up. And it is a way of experiencing the, uh, the actions of the past that may bring out that come up. So I think association is one of the main things here. Uh, and that association happens in the stream of consciousness. Uh, it doesn't really need to be stored anywhere. Uh, it is just part and parcel of the stream of consciousness where we associate things. All these things are kind of uh, embedded somehow in that consciousness. So. Mm. So in, in the end, it's a bit mysterious. I don't really know the answer to these things, uh, but uh, something like that anyway. Yeah. Mm. Great. Um, what do I do with attachments that I'm grasping to, that I'm aware of, but I'm not ready to let go of? Um, don't just uh, just observe it. Yeah, just uh, just be aware of it. Uh, uh, try to know the problem yeah know that this will cause suffering down the track yeah, because you know that uh, uh, nature will force these things uh, to, to become obvious to you at some point yeah everything has to go eventually you can't control these things uh, so have an awareness that it will lead to problems and then at the same time develop an alternative kind of happiness this is what we're doing on the path uh, because as you're developing the alternative happiness the spiritual one uh, you are freeing yourself from that reliance on those things that you are attached to. The reason why you can't let it go is because you still see happiness in those things. So by understanding the suffering in them and developing an alternative happiness, you can free yourself from that holding on to an inferior kind of happiness. So this is one of those, I think, very so nice things about the path it makes you more independent as a person yeah and more or less dependent on the happinesses that are by nature unstable and satisfactory problematic and then you uh, uh, as a consequence you yeah you, your life obviously improves because of that uh, so that's yeah something like that uh. lovely so we have another one on uh, grasping are craving and grasping basically the direct opposite of loving kindness? The direct opposite of uh, loving kindness. Uh, um, I don't know if they are the direct opposite, but uh, certainly when you have loving kindness, you don't really crave and grasp anymore. Yeah? Uh, the, the problem with grasping, especially when we grasp people, is that we want them to behave in a certain way. Yeah, I mean, for example, if you have a partner in life, yeah, and uh, 
that partner behaves badly or whatever, especially, or if, let's say you have a child, that's kind of more classical example, you want that child to behave properly, yeah, when other people are around. You don't want that child to kind of misbehave because if you look bad if your child behaves badly, yeah, that's how you feel. The grasping said, this is my child, yeah, it's an, the child is an extension of your ego, an extension of your sense of self. That's really what it is. And so you have a vested interest in the child's behavior. And because you have a vested interest in your child's behavior, it is not that your interest is actually in your own happiness. Yeah? What you get out of that child, you want the child to behave right for you, look good. It is not really about the child itself. Of course, it is partly about the child as well. Yeah? It's, a, it's a mixed thing, it's kind of complicated because you're also concerned about the child's happiness of course but it's also about you and because of that it is not a pure kind of love so if you develop loving kindness fully and it becomes a kind of universal loving kindness and you treat your children in that way then yes it does overcome that grasping and clinging and you can look at what is in the best interest of the child rather than what you would like to see because you are attachment or you're grasping onto that child. So in that sense, it is true. There is a kind of opposite there. But whether they are exact opposites, I'm not sure. I think letting go is really the exact opposite of grasping, yeah, for obvious reasons. And craving as well, it is true. One of the great ways of reducing craving is loving kindness, because if you have loving kindness, that is a source of happiness that is far superior to anything you can crave in the world. Yeah. So uh, loving kindness reduces the first hindrance of sensory desire because you have no interest in the world anymore. In fact, all the five hindrances are largely gone if you have a very powerful loving kindness. Your mind is bright, you don't have any tiredness, and you are not restless because you have no craving. You certainly have no ill will if you have loving kindness, it's the exact opposite of ill will. So yes, loving kindness also counteracts craving and also grasping. I think it's better to think of them as counteracting these things rather than direct opposites. Uh, but it does help you in overcoming those things. Right. Interesting that you mentioned partners and children because there were two questions about that. <laughs> so one is, how can I deal with romantic jealousy and the fear of being cheated on and abandoned by my partner? This sometimes becomes obsessive and gets in the way of my meditation. Hmm. Yeah, well, uh, I think you would, <laughs> what you can do is you can just, uh, you know, one of the things that you have to remember is, is that your partner will have to leave you one day anyway. Yeah, it's going to happen sooner or later. And you don't know when it's going to happen. It could happen soon it could happen because your partner has an accident and dies yeah these things happen uh, and we certainly don't want it but it has and will happen uh, or, it, or it may happen uh, or of course eventually your partner is going to die so death is certain separation is certain the question really is only when uh, yeah is it going to be soon or is it going to be tomorrow uh, next year or is it going to be when you get old or whatever it is uh, and because it's going to happen anyway, yeah, you have to get used to the idea of separation or someone leaving you. And whether they, your partner leaves you for someone else or they leave you because they die, well, it really is the same thing. Yeah? It is the same issue. The problem is really the same one. Yeah? It's more painful if they leave for someone else because you, you feel like you have lost out to somebody else yeah you feel like someone else is better than you and maybe you feel slighted or you feel that you know you can value or something like that that is part of the problem of someone going off with somebody else yeah that you feel like somehow you are not as good as you thought you were aware. but the reality of the problem is just that uh, basically the person is going yeah and this additional thing that we feel unvalued is really just a uh, something that you should uh, let go of straight away because you can never be valued by everyone in the world there's always going to be someone who doesn't you know does not value the nature of life we can never be liked by everybody and if this one person in life chooses someone else it doesn't really mean anything at all about you it just means that for some reason they're heading in a different direction the real issue here is the of separation, and we have to lose people. 
So just remember, you have to lose them anyway. Yeah, that is the worst case scenario. The worst case scenario is that your partner dies tomorrow, yeah, or the day after or next week. Yeah. Are you ready for that? Yeah? Can you deal with that? Yeah? And if you can deal with that because you have contemplated that enough, enough, uh, that is what you really have to try to do. Yeah, if you can deal with that, then you will be able to deal, I think, with any kind of separation. Uh, it may be this sounds perhaps really harsh yeah and really really rough but uh, uh, it is also quite realistic about the nature of life it's realistic about where we have to go and for that reason it is uh, I, I think it can be helpful if you allow yourself gradually to approach this very gradually so and then you will get some peace in your meditation as well yeah okay if my partner doesn't come back to life okay i can live with that uh, or, or whatever uh, then you can kind of move forward uh, so uh, take it gradually. All of these things are gradual. Any insight on the Buddhist path, any understanding about these deep issues of life don't happen overnight. Uh, and uh, it will be uh, hard if you pr pressure yourself too much to deal with things. Uh, but gradually allow these ideas to build in your mind. Yeah? At the same time, build up resilience in yourself. Uh, and resilience happens really through the practice of the spiritual path. Uh, you become resilient because you have resources within yourself that are can withstand the external pressures of the world. So building up resilience inside of yourself and also contemplating the nature of the world, these two things coming together will give you that ability, I think, to withstand some of these, uh, these shocks in life and to de deal with these things better now. Right. <laughs> We've got quite a lot of Something questions like that, yeah. again. Okay. Uh, so yeah. we'll see what we can do. So, dear Ajahn, it seems cruel to bring children to the world when one is acutely aware of the suffering. What is your opinion, please? Well, you, you are, the thing here is that you are not bringing children into the world. The children are bringing themselves into the world. You are just a conduit for those children to appear. Yeah. We, we are born because of craving, not because our parents kind of bring us into the world. So what you are doing really is that you are just allowing someone to come into your life. This is another person with its own past and all these kinds of things. And if you are a good person, good qualities, you can actually add something to that person's life. Yeah, you can do something positive. So it really depends on the qualities that you have as a parent and whether you are willing to undertake the sacrifice it is to be a parent. That's the way I see it as a kind of sacrifice. If you are unwilling to undertake that and you want to make someone else's life, yeah, build up, help someone else, then you can do a marvelous thing about creating maybe one more happy person in this world. Yeah, That is the right way of thinking about it. We don't bring anyone into the world. What we're doing, if we live well, we're helping someone to have a good existence, just like we help other people around us. So. Yeah, great. Uh, dear Ajahn, when I sit for meditation and focus on the breath, I notice I immediately feel happy. Is that a hindrance? As I'm wondering if I'm attached to the happiness feeling and not spending enough time observing the breath. Should I be more mindful and stay with the breath than the happiness? <laughs> Uh, you, you don't have to choose. Yeah, there's, there's no there's no kind of one or the other. Uh, we, I, we will have a look at the Anapanasati Sutta, the Sutta on mindfulness of breathing later on. Uh, and that Sutta is full of the combination of happiness and watching the breath. Yeah, you can, the breath can be there and the happiness at the same time. Uh, you don't have to choose between one or the other. Uh, um, if you feel that you have to choose, it is probably because you are holding holding too much to the breath, yeah? Uh, the breath should not really be held. The breath should be something that is present and that you just very gently guide your awareness to the breath. It shouldn't be something that you have to hold. If you hold the breath, then that might be detrimental to your happiness because the holding itself is an unpleasant state that may uh, make the happiness disappear. But the idea is to be happy, detached, sitting back, being aware of the breath, which is always there anyway. The breath is always around, uh, yeah? And then uh, uh, experiencing the breath with the happiness. Uh, 
So that is the idea. In fact, this is exactly what we're trying to do. Yeah, this is exactly the point of kind of this whole practice is to give rise to the joy and then bring the breath and the joy together somehow. So sometimes you can just breathe and the and joy comes from the breath meditation, and other times you have to do another contemplation to help the joy arising. But to bring these two together is precisely what the path is about. Uh, so that's marvelous. Yeah, it's wonderful that you are feeling happiness, and, and now try to somehow develop it into a proper meditation object. Uh, right. Um, dear Ajahn, uh, okay, first of all, a thanks for the deep, insightful, thought provoking talk. So that's thanking everybody, including the support team. And the question is that the mother of this person's children has a rare form of cancer. Even though they're 16 and 18, how can I stop worrying about the impact on them if she dies early and process this through the Noble Eightfold Path? Okay, so. Uh... Uh, usually your children are going to be okay. Yeah, I, I, I think it's very, very likely they will be all right. Uh, young people are very, usually are resourceful. Yeah, they are able to deal with things. Uh, I, my sister died about, what is it, a year and a half ago or something now. She had two children in almost exactly that age, yeah, almost exactly the age you're talking about. Uh, and they have done really well. Yeah, really, really well. They are carrying on with their lives. It didn't really seem to have a, such a tremendous impact on, at all. Yeah, Of course, this is going to vary from person to person, but it's far from obvious that it will necessarily have a massive impact on them. But one of the things that you should do is you should prepare them for the possibility. Yeah? Talk to them about it. Yeah, tell them that, well, you know, uh, uh, tell them about the nature of death from a Buddhist perspective, uh, yeah, how kind of things might go on afterwards, and uh, uh, you know, tell them that you have been living a good life, so you probably will be going to a good place when you die. Yeah, you can, you can tell them that if you want. Uh, and it's interesting because, you know, when we all, when we consider how, the Buddha, how, how so many people have lived this Buddhist path, contemplation of death has always been a very positive force. Uh, been a force that having, has encouraged people to practice the spiritual life, all kinds of things. So if you negotiate this in the right way with your children, talk to them about this in the right way, it may <coughs> turn out to become, be even a, a blessing in disguise, if you know what I mean. I'm not suggesting that death is good, but I'm saying that it can be turned into something positive if you deal with this in the right way. So it's a matter of reminding them this is the reality of existence. But what do we do with that? Well, what we do with that is we emphasize the things that are spiritual instead. We emphasize the development of things that we can take with us beyond death. Yeah, that is the kind of the important outcome or conclusion that we must draw from these uh, massive problems in life. So uh, this isn't necessarily bad at all, uh, and uh, it's really. Be what try to be wise about it, try to think about this in a constructive way so that you can actually uh, introduce one of the profound uh, um, spiritual potentials in life in the right in the uh, through this particular process you're going through. Thanks, Ajahn. There's about four more questions, they're quite short, I think. Um, shall we try and do yeah. them? Yeah, <laughs> okay, yeah. great. So, is volition required to generate karma? If so, would karma generating activities be a good translation for the word sankara? Uh, yes, karma generating activities. Yeah, you can, you can, you can say that. Okay. Uh, uh, karma generating activities. Um, karma is. Yeah, I'm not sure if it is an ideal translation because uh, kamma is actually the action itself. Yeah, so it's more like the kamma is the activity is that is actually kamma, and then uh, and the result is what kind of gets generated from that. The result is how you feel down the track because of that. That's the vipaka or the pala of that. Uh, yeah, so. Uh, you, the way that the word karma is used in colloquial uh, 
the language in English or whatever it is used slightly different from how it is used in the suttas, but it's actually the action itself, which is the kamma. Yeah. So the kamma generating it is like saying action generated activities, which you know doesn't quite work, if you know what I mean. So uh, it, it is more to say, to say willed activities. Uh, is, uh, if you say willed activity, I am willing it, uh, then I think that is a, a preferable translation. Hmm. Thanks, Ajahn. Um, okay. Since most of us don't get to see areas very often, how can we ensure association with the wise in lay life? Okay, read the suttas. Yeah, listen to the suttas and listen to a nice exposition of the sutta. There are lots of nice expositions out there. Uh, hang on to the Buddha, make the Buddha your friend. Yeah, your Kalyan. Imagine having the Buddha as a Kalyanita. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it doesn't get much cooler than that. And to make the Buddha your friend. I want to take that up. I always tell people, and I think this is really, really kind of powerful, actually. And this is the idea that the Buddha taught the suttas two and a half thousand years ago. He was not just teaching the audience in front of him. We tend to think that the Buddha was the teacher of Venerable Ananda, or Venerable Sariputta, or uh, Venerable Soma, you know, or Upalavanna, the great Deepanese. But actually, when the Buddha taught the suttas, uh, he knew that he was setting in motion the wheel of the Dharma. He knew that this would get passed on from one generation to the next one, through the centuries, through the millennia, from one culture to another one. And he knew what, was going, what he was doing. Yeah? And because of that, that is why he taught in a very generic way. He taught in a way that is possible for everyone to understand it. He used a language that was not specific to Indian culture, but a language that is kind of cross-cultural and cross-temporal. It doesn't get stuck in time or stuck in one culture. So he knew what he was doing. And for that reason, you can say, without really exaggerating very much, that he had us in mind when he told these things. Yeah, he had you in mind. Yeah. So the Buddha really is your Kalyanamita. He taught, he taught, I don't know what your name is, but he taught about someone just like you, man. Yeah. Um, not wanting to know his message, wanting to understand it. So he taught it in a way so we can understand these things. And so when you read the suttas, remember that the Buddha is talking to you. Yeah. Almost literally talking to you. So that kind of makes it more personal. Yeah, this is the Buddha talking to you. It makes it very, very personal. And that actually makes him your teacher in a very, very direct sense. So, and this is not just wishful thinking here. This is actually what comes out of the idea of teaching in a universal way, because this is a gift to humanity. It's a gift to every human being who takes an interest in these teachings. And because you are a human being who's taking an interest in these teachings, it is a gift to you. And the Buddha is giving you this gift. So remember that when you're reading the suttas, the Buddha is talking to you. And if that helps you, it will inspire you and you'll get even more out of these teachings. You will start to listen really, really carefully when you read the suttas. What is he trying to say, the Buddha? What is this really about? Yeah, you will listen far more carefully if the teacher is there right in front of you. Okay, okay. just two more now. So, could Ajahn please elaborate on the line in Sutta 1.31? One shines amidst one's relations. I think that's the younger two, maybe. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's from the Sangyutta Nikaya. Oh, Samyutta. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I just think it means pretty much what I. Well, I think it can mean a number of things. Yeah, it can mean that you are. It could mean that you are more. Kind of you stand out from the crowd yeah, because you, you are more shiny. <laughs> you are more, you know, it's like sometimes people stand out of the crowd because they are kinder. Yeah, you look at them and think, wow, this person, they are different from the other ones. Yeah, they're more kind and they kind of stand out in that way. So maybe you are more shiny in that sense. You stand out a bit in that way. That's one way of thinking, of thinking about it. Yeah, so you become. And of course, other people are inspired by that. Yeah, this is another way that you shine in your family. People will approach you. 
They will ask you questions. Maybe you have a certain wisdom. Yeah, they will be interested in what you have done. If you shine very bright in the presence of your family, they will take an interest. Why? Why is my mom or dad or son or daughter? How come they have changed? What is going on here? They will be interested in because everybody wants to be happy. And if, this, if we see happiness in a certain place, then we will be interested and we will want to find out what actually is going on there. So uh, you, we become like a beacon in the world. Yeah, we become a beacon for others. So it's like you see an area, you see a noble person, you see someone who has really, really special qualities. And yeah? sometimes you meet people who really shine in an extraordinary way. Yeah? Like uh, Ajahn Gandha, one of my favorite monks in Thailand, he really shines. Yeah, it's just uh, you get this, this is like this, but he shines even more. Of being an area, you really, you really, really, really shine there. And you get this feeling just being in the presence of someone like that. It's just very powerful. Right? It's like getting access to a different reality without being there yourself, but you get a glimpse into a different reality, a reality which is extraordinarily attractive and beautiful. Yeah? And if we can be like that to our, to our relatives, uh, uh, so that they, we, they can see part of that alternative reality through us, uh, then we become extraordinarily useful to our relatives. Uh, we bring them onto the path. Uh, we guide them onto this beautiful teaching of the Buddha, yeah? And we help others to head in the right direction. Uh, anyway, I think that's, that's part of it. But you can make, you know, remember that um, these things are there for contemplation, yeah? Especially these things, they are verse. And verse can often be read in many different ways. So, you know, I think what I'm saying, I think it's probably roughly right. But uh, uh, think about it in your own way. Yeah. Uh, reflect on what you think you might mean, and then make it your own teaching uh, that you take with you. Okay. okay. Somebody just sent a funny message to summarize the teachings for the day. They said, Buddhists are shiny, happy people. <laughs> <laughs> so, so one more question, Ajahn, about the devas. Does Ajahn think it's likely that there are devas or demons living as humans or animals in our plane of existence? And if so, do they know that they are devas or demons? <laughs> I well, it, it, they may you know. I mean, human beings we have all these qualities within us. Yeah. And the, the, sometimes the suttas they say that they are human beings who are like devas because they, the qual internal qualities are like the devas. So in the same way, by the same token, you would say that there are certain people among us who are so kind of uh, have such negative qualities, yeah, that you would maybe even call them demons. And that is because of their internal qualities. Yeah, that's really where that comes from. So judging by, I would say, by our psychology, you can call, you can divide people into these kind of categories. Uh, but uh, I don't think they literally are devas or demons among us. Uh, um, I think that is, uh, I, I don't actually know, it's an interesting question. Yeah, are some of the people we see, are they perhaps real devas and real demons? <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that one. And possibly, uh, there's so many strange things that are possible in this world, uh, but I would just Generally, I would consider people to be people, but they can have the psychological qualities of these beings. That's certainly, certainly for sure. The other aspect is a bit more uh, speculative. Great. <laughs> okay. So that's all the questions, Ajay. Okay. Yeah. Great. Oof, I'm, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad. So, right. So that's it then. So shall we say sadhu to you? Sadhu. 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 Sadh